Hi, welcome uh, to this show of uh, uh, on the transit-oriented development, as they call it. And uh, we have uh, uh, a panel of uh, discussions. Uh, let me introduce you to the panel straight away before going to the topic. Uh, we have with us uh, Swapna Little, who is a historian, an architect historian. Uh, uh, we have Mr. Prem Chandravarkar, who is uh, an architect based at Bangalore. Swapna is uh, joining us from Delhi. Uh, then we have Rajiv Bhakt, who is again uh, an architect and uh, an urban designer, uh, who is also joining us from uh, Delhi. Uh, and we have Malchri Joshi, uh, uh, who is also an urban planner and an architect, uh, also joining from Delhi. Then we have Sanjay Srivastava, who is a sociologist, uh, who joins us from London. Uh, you know, we can understand the time frame that we that is there in London. Uh, and we have Anuj Malhotra, who is an urban development expert, uh, mobility expert rather, who joins us from Ahmedabad. And Narayan Murthy, who is an uh, uh, architect, designer, planner, who once again joins us from Delhi. Welcome, uh, all of you, to this show. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, as as all of you uh, are aware, I mean, this discussion is on the the proposed uh, amendments on the uh, the Delhi uh, uh, the Delhi Master Plan, which is being promulgated by the Delhi Development Authority, and uh, especially on the transit-oriented development. Uh, so, and uh, 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 just before jumping on to the topic and uh, letting our viewers understand what a TOD is. And how would it affect the overall paradigm uh, shift in urban planning in Delhi and also throughout the country? But I think there's one point which I would like to mention before we just start off uh, the discussion. And I think I think that pertains to uh, the overall uh, development strategy that uh, that that is being uh, witnessed in the country, especially in the last three decades, and where we are finding that uh, the spatial strategies that we are building are actually turning cities into luxury products. I mean, this is one of the fairest criticism I've come about. Now, if, if a city becomes a luxury product, and as uh, one of the uh, articles that I read pointed out, that it would eventually lead to gentrification. Now, if TOD amendments in the Delhi Master Plan, uh, especially in the, uh, in the TOD, leads to gentrification, then what will happen to our sustainable development goals, I mean, to which we are committed to in the urban habitat? Uh, and I think there's another, the, the two more questions that we would like to ponder over, and that is, uh, what kind of a city? I mean, we know what is going wrong, but we also ought to know what would be good, what would be good for the overall trajectory of the world. I think we'll discuss all those points, and we are uh, uh, extremely glad that we have uh, one of the finest people of uh, our country who actually plan cities, design cities. So, yeah, welcome uh, all of you. And Narayan, straight away, I want to go uh, to you, reach out to you, and can you just explain to, you know, because our viewers would be somebody who, who haven't even heard about a TOD, and as you have rightly pointed out in your uh, article, that many of the architects are also not even aware of the changes that are being brought out uh, in the transit-oriented development, and why a transit-oriented development? Why transit? Why not a full development? I mean, and how does it come in contradiction with the, the overall master plan strategies? Please. I'll, um, thank you. I'm on a panel with much cleverer people than me, so you'll have to pardon me for anything that wrong inferences that I do draw. Uh, but most cities uh, live uh, uh, exist according to a sort of a plan, a master plan that's made by a, a group of professionals to try and predict how that city will grow in the near future. Um, this is not something new. I mean, India, this Indian subcontinent is some of the oldest planned cities on earth, as it were. Mohenjo-daro, Daro, Harappa, Dholavira, Lothal, these are all well-known examples. So that's a method in which a city tries to figure out how it will be. Now, Delhi has always had a master plan. Since 1957, uh, we've had a development authority devoted to this called DDA. And that's the kind of uh, thing that's being copied through the rest of the country. I think every city in India now has some kind of a planning body called the Something Development Authority, uh, MMRDA or BDA or KMDA would be examples of the same thing. Now, Delhi always had a master plan since 1957. At some point in the early 2000s, when Delhi began to begin uh, build its metro, 
uh, people began to realize that these things like the metro are really going to give shape to the city to come. You know, the paths that they choose to take will naturally see the certain kind of growth. At that time, there was a bunch of uh, architects, planners, and so on, uh, who, recognizing this fact, helped the government write a policy whereby this growth that came along the metro lines or any other transport-oriented uh, line, which is why it's called the transit-oriented development, it could be the BRTS in a city which doesn't have a metro but has a BRTS instead, mm -hmm. that they would then seed that growth in a logical manner, logical in a manner which was the, uh, the, the parameters which they drew for themselves, which they considered desirable were uh, livable, walkable, equitable. So it was all about social equity uh, to a certain extent, as well as the ease of everyday life that this was about. It recognized the fact that our cities had grown very uncomfortable to live in. You know, they were chaotic. Uh, they were congested in certain areas not dense enough in certain areas. Um, and there were a lot of people who found these cities very difficult to negotiate. So, so, Maran, you don't find, so, 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 so you do not find any problem with the TODA per se. Per it's say, only I that the amendments that, that are being brought out. No, not at all. I mean, okay, after all, if you look at cities like London okay. or Paris or New York, fine, they really built yeah. around their transit or, uh, uh, systems. You know, the metro or the tube or whatever it's called in those countries has been the progenitor of the form of the city that we know today in the last century, let's say, because they have some of the world's oldest metro systems. I don't think any architect or planner or any uh, intelligent person who studied the policy has any uh, problem with this at all. The issue has been that, yeah, it was a new policy for India. We are not the same as every other nation in the world. We have a lot of social inequity. We have poverty. Policies so what is the problem? So, so what? So what is the problem? So what is the problem no, no. with the with the amendments? Then, so when they wrote the TOD, it was a very valiant attempt. The idea was to adapt that system. It's an American thought actually to start with, to adapt that system to the Indian reality, the Indian reality of poverty, social inequality, and the fact that a lot of our cities, despite having master plans on paper, had actually grown very differently from the way that was envisaged in the plan. So therefore, there was a level of experimentation that was recognized and it was fair enough because there was nobody who was intelligent enough who could have thought of this and written it the right way. Now, unfortunately, there's been a lot of tinkering with this transit-oriented development policy in the years that have followed. Some of it has been legitimate in that we really don't know how it's going to work. So we need to keep titrating it as we go along. We need to see how does the city respond once the metro is built and then make certain shifts and changes to that policy. And that's master planning for you because it's not static. You know, we are human beings who live in a city. Things keep yeah. changing and the master planners recognize that. Now, what has happened very recently in 2019, which a lot of us didn't notice, and unfortunately, that's the reason why you see a preponderance of architects on this panel. I mean, it's not as if all the citizens of India are architects. But unfortunately, it's only architects who are able to look at these policy papers and, you know, statistics and data and the way these things are written to be able to analyze and translate them into what is the coming reality. Uh, so unfortunately, that's the reason why we have a lot of architects. But as it happened, even we architects didn't notice in 2019 that very drastic changes had been made to this transit-oriented development policy. Some of these changes removed some of what was considered desirable to have when devising the original policy. OK. OK, fine. So, uh, uh, Prem, can, uh, 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 are you able to hear? Yes, yes. Yeah, great. So, I think uh, just uh, taking from where Narayan left, uh, I mean, do you also find uh, uh, there is there going to be a policy paradigm shift as far as the urban policy is concerned? Are TOD is going to just take over the entire uh, planning uh, process in the country as far as urbanism is concerned? Because we've seen a lot many documents coming up. We had the smart cities. Then we had uh, uh, the NUPF, which don't, nobody speaks about, the National Urban Policy Framework. Is this the policy paradigm shift that you're looking at? It could be, but it has to be looked at together with many other aspects. So, for example, the uh, okay. problem with the way the current policy is uh, framed 
looks only at densities within the influence area of a mass transit line. That means uh, about 500 meters on either side of the line. But you can't just look at uh, densities there. You have to look at <clears throat> densities across the city. So for example, suppose you had a city which, whose uh, traffic networks were already overloaded and you're just adding more density near the mass transit line, you're not going to solve a congestion problem. If you're going to increase densities along the mass transit line, you go to lower densities in, in other areas. So, so one, uh, the problem with the current policy, it looks as, as, as if the TOD is some uh, magic bullet which will solve everything, whereas if you need a holistic view of the city. Okay. So that's, that's one part. And could you just also explain, uh, uh, because as Narayan was mentioning, that it would not just uh, be uh, limited to Delhi, and then it may be copied uh, in many other cities. I mean, uh, but do, do, you, do you feel that sense also prevailing? It could be like, uh, as Narayan mentioned, Delhi was the first, uh, one of the first cities to set up a development authority and that was copied. So Delhi seems to have, a, it, it tends to have an influence uh, across the country. Uh, plus being the national capital, every citizen has a stake in it. But uh, so that's why someone like me sitting in Bangalore is concerned about what's happening in Delhi right now. Uh, uh, not just yeah, metro, because of the- yeah. metro, Like metro has been copied everywhere. I mean, despite the fact that many of the cities may not want metros at all, I mean, as far as the urban mobility is concerned, isn't it? Yes. Um, okay. Unfortunately, one of the other things that we have in India is we get uh, uh, large mega projects pushed through with uh, sometimes specific interests in mind, which are not always looked at in terms of their uh, sort of holistic benefit to the city. I think, uh, uh, Sanjay, can, can you hear here? Yes, yes, I can hear you. So, so what? So we've seen uh, two architects speaking about the TOD, but uh, as a sociologist, what is the problem with TOD? Because I've seen so many sociologists writing about it that look, it's it it uh, it invites gentrification. It's quite uh, exclusive in nature, uh, you know, all, all that uh, all that stuff. So, how how do you understand this? Uh, I mean, the, especially the amendments that are yeah. and, and uh, from just, from a sociological so, angle, what is a TOD? Mm -hmm. But just to just to build upon what Narayan and Prem have just said, I think um, we need a sense of the larger picture in terms of what's happening in the So as you as you mentioned, Tekinda, just now, one of the largest projects since the 1950s in terms of building entirely new cities and new urban development. I say 1950s because that's when the steel project, steel city project happened. happened right? That's the largest state intervention in urban uh, building entirely new cities. Uh, is, is the smart cities contribution uh, uh, right now. And I wanted to start with that because it's a, it's, I think it is a basis of what is what the government is trying to do, the state is trying to do in other fields. So what happens in the smart city thing, of course, is that it's trying to change entirely, not only the administ administrative structure of cities, but also the way urban spaces are imagined. And thirdly, how, thirdly, how they're to be financed. Because as I'm sure all of you know that the Smart Cities uh, mission is premised on this uh, special purpose vehicle, which asks um, finances to be raised in a certain manner, the, the running of the uh, urban governance itself to be organized in a similar manner. That is to take away some of the powers of governance and, and governmentality from the elected representatives to, in effect, global consultants. I think that is the larger model within which we need to understand uh, as Prem was saying, that it isn't just about what happens around a specific metro line, but the broader sense in, in which you understand the city. I think the larger model really has to be understood. The larger context should be understood in terms of the different kind of changes that are being put in place, which are about finance, which is about what elected representatives can or cannot do. I mean, whatever the ills of our system in terms of um, uh, elected representatives don't do, uh, some there's a little there's always a little gap where you can approach an elected representative and get certain things done, and so the it seems to me the one the problem with the TOD is of course and I think that I was saying that it is an it is it is an American model and that itself is not always a bad thing that's you know, that's okay, uh, but um, what happens how do you apply to the in 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 a in a in an urban context which is hugely asymmetrical, right? um, do you want a series of cities which are in effect nothing but when that's what's happening, a series of gated communities, which is what, what our cities have become. Um, do you want a, a, a city where uh, 
whatever little public intermingling that happens and tends to reduce the sense of asymmetry that cities have, even that disappears. So I think um, if you want to think about the TOD, uh, then you need to go back to fundamentally what should be the relationship between citizens, any citizen, and the state. Because what's happening here, just reading Narayan's article and reading the other material that was sent to me, is, a, is, is largely, and that's, that's a norm in our urban planning, a largely very top-down, um, and in the, a, a further deepening of the top-down relationship between citizens of the state. Um, and that's been there since almost from um, you know, Delhi Improvement Trust, which was 1937, and then it's, it's, it's abolished and DDA becomes the, the, urban, uh, urban, the urban planning body in Delhi. Um, and that has become deeper. You would think that with globalization, whatever other platitudes people use, that things become decentralized. But I think what has happened right now is a deep centralization which involves a transformation in what the state is and its association with the, with private global capital. And yeah. that is really going to affect what is happening in our cities. That's one way that I think I just following on from what Narayan and, and Prem have said. Thanks, Ajay. I mean, you really brought out uh, an important uh, element. And before I jump to Swapna, because uh, we would like to know more about the heritage aspect of, uh, of how the uh, how it will be affected after the amendments being incorporated eventually in the TOD. Uh, I think Balashree, uh, 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 because uh, uh, she is uh, an urban planner, designer in Delhi. Balashree, uh, how do you understand uh, the changes that are, uh, that are being brought out? And as would you also like to comment on, uh, you know, I remember KCR used to uh, very, very, uh, I mean, he used to make fun of all that stuff that look, cities are being governed by uh, the parasitals, actually, the parasitals are running the city, and like Sanjay also pointed out, actually, it's the DDA, not the Delhi government. <laughs> the poor Delhi government, the Delhi chief minister happens to be just a metropolitan mayor, nothing more than that. And that also, uh, I mean, we can understand how empowered uh, the Delhi chief minister is. So, mm. Balashi, would you like to bring in that uh, element also? And uh, uh, I mean, mm. how are you viewing it? Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, yeah, so I just want to say also that I'm not an and urban then, planner. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and if you could just also bring in uh, the contradiction that actually develops between the master plan and the TOD. Yeah, um, that's something that I'd like to talk about. I'm an architect by training and I've taught uh, city planning and uh, city design, city critique courses uh, at the School of Architecture for several years. So I come in from... Uh, I mean, I come in uh, with a slightly more critical perspective on on the TOD. And uh, given that we're talking about it today, I also feel that we need to locate this development somehow within the current crisis. And, uh, you know, we're talking about an outdated idea that has that we are importing and we cannot do it without localizing it in the time and space that we're in right now. So, so when, you, when, you, when, you, when yeah. you say it's an outdated idea, what does that mean? Uh, so I'll come to that. But uh, I mean, I mean that we are bringing in, uh, bringing this in uh, decades after American cities have okay, uh, right. implemented yeah. them. So just in terms right. of the time, we are borrowing an idea and we are locating it within a city that is struck by several crises, uh, not least the present one. Uh, we are dealing with uh, air pollution, we are dealing with uh, fast depleting continuous urban greens, and we're dealing in Delhi with an extremely uh, poor overall urban quality of life. So, and the current, uh, you know, pandemic will, and it is already intensifying everything. And it puts really under sharp focus the things that we have held dear as urban planners, designers, architects, the kind of things that we've talked about. And one of the things that I thought it really brings under question is this, is this idea of urban density. Uh, the TOD is being looked at as a tool to densify or to induce uh, densification in pockets around the, you know, uh, the hubs around the metro stations. So and, what's wrong with it? I mean, uh, I mean, so my question is, you know, I mean, arguments, yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the arguments is that, look, if a person has to trudge a distance of, uh, say, half a mile or one fourth yeah. of a mile, yeah. I mean, it's use the carbon footprint so i mean how yeah. i mean what is the problem with that no no nothing there's no there's no so the thing with the, these concepts as concepts of course as in language there's no problem with it we should have mixed okay. use dense uh, walkable 
areas okay. but the thing is we live in a del- we live in a city which is already dense it's poor yeah. and it's mixed we i mean in and you know and coming back to the pandemic we are finding it increasingly problematic and this is a you know urban density is a twin edged sword to prevent infections from spreading and in guise of delivery of service you know in the uh, the in guise of the problem in delivering services the government is also looking at these areas as completely unruly so there is that one side of urban density that is being questioned and we don't know how this is going how we're going to emerge from it so while we are romanticizing dense urban neighborhoods you know like the jane jacobs middle class they don't really exist because in delhi people live in dense colonies chalked out of agricultural land uh, outside of the master plan that have been incrementally developed and authorized these are 50 to 100 square yard houses laid out around streets which are 20 30 feet at best and they're running at you know perpendicular they have shops on the ground they have open drains the balconies barely let in the sunlight on the ground there are no parks the plots are built edge to edge so with a four or five story uh, development which is uh, you know cheek to cheek you are talking about an fir of five already yeah you're yeah. building so the, yeah. there's no problem talking about walkability high density mixed land use but when you look around you this is where delhi lives today most of the city is living outside of the master plan in these dense neighborhoods which are already now stigmatized with this pandemic i quickly went over the list of the 43 uh, neighborhoods that have been the, that are now the containment zones today and some eight or nine are the ones that i could see which are clearly in the master plan areas all the others are bastis urban villages unauthorized regularized colonies so again not to stigmatize these further but people are already living in maximum density with no safe access to open areas open space how do we talk about tod in a city like this if you i mean what happens to a home grown city where the where the state is refusing to intervene with all these concepts like you know walkability etc the state does not or cannot intervene in these neighborhoods how do we talk about uh, tod then so of course there is no there's no ideal there's no problem in a innocent word like walkability but these questions are redundant in places which are which have developed despite the state and the, and you know for me there's an added there's a, there's just one more point that i'd like to raise in relation to this question of density and again coming back to the crisis at the moment which is also a crisis of the environment is the overall question of well-being when we recover and when we have beaten down this curve we will have at hand a multi, like a huge mental health crisis amplified by the fact that our homes have no lights our workplaces are dim dense Uh, we don't have enough places to recuperate we have no parks and forests and the state sponsored development on the other hand that we have seen right you know at the moment in the recent times has gone from being barely tolerable to outright horrific i mean look at east kidwai nagar look at naroji nagar the world trade tower coming up there the high rise development that dmrc has erected at prime stations like the okla these are monstrosities and all of these per se are tod they are within or in walkable distance to the metro Wait, station yeah. and yeah, uh, what confidence do we have in a government to develop a city for the well being of its people i mean look at what we have done at the moment we have in kidwai nagar a multiple basement development edge to edge no no big tr- trees are possible in this area because this just it just stacked with basements so and there is no push to get the residents to take the car even though you're right next to the metro station right. so what are we talking about transit oriented development right. we will we'll come back i think that's yeah. a very relevant point that you raised i'm so glad that you raised that point we'll come back again uh, once we have a second round of discussion yeah but i think i would like to jump to anuj uh, anuj can you hear me uh, can you just unmute your button yeah great yes Yeah. So uh, actually, Anuj and I, we were together in Leh. I've been preparing some kind of mobility. <laughs> I don't know whether it will work or not ever. Uh, so Anuj, I mean, what what uh, what we just heard from Molishree 
it looks like a mystification no i mean something mystified huh? yeah. and uh, so would, would you would you like to demystify the entire thing i mean this entire tod planning and how is it different from the current uh, process of planning please yeah uh, sure tikender sir thank you so much uh, <clears throat> yeah a couple of um, interesting points raised by uh, ms joshi and also sanjay ji and prem ji uh, which i would like to kind of i mean i felt like uh, jumping in at that point but uh, yeah, yeah. i want to sort of uh, also respond to some of the points that they were making uh, interestingly uh, uh, i would very uh, strongly say Uh, that it is very unfortunate that TOD is read as a policy which brings in FAR, mm-hmm. and that is the whole point of contention which I clearly read in. What does more- that mean? Please, please, please try to explain sure. that in more simpler terms. I yeah, will. For our view. Sure, yeah. I will. I will just explain. So yeah. FAR is basically a floor area ratio, yeah. which means that how much you can build on a plot of land. and uh, say for example in a 100 far or a 150 far you can typically build about five story uh, four to five story building and in a 500 far uh, you could easily go up to 20 30 40 stories or even higher so uh, those are that's the uh, main uh, thing about far and that is primarily because there is a certain area of land on which you can build and you can't build less than that it's particularly a 1 hectare land so 1 hectare any land plot which is above 1 hectare will confirm will have the tod regulations applied to them lesser than 1 hectare you can't apply tod regulations so uh, uh so uh, yeah i what i was saying is that unfortunately it, it is very unfortunate actually i would like to use that word that tod is equal to far right now in most of the minds of planners architects and general fraternity i would say that has been a huge loss in communication uh, in terms of the tod communication and that responsibility i think it is the responsibility of all the planners all the government officials everybody who had been involved with tod including me maybe i have also not communicated it enough that it's not about far far is just one uh, uh, one incentive that one gets on a larger plot that's all but if you look at all the other principles of tod which are hugely beneficial and that is precisely what tod was and has been conceived now what is tod let me also please say i think i completely i uh, mr narayan murthy completely said all the points but some of the two three points i would like to add here uh, uh, which murthy sir did not say uh one is that uh, the most important point is that the tod gives the flexibility of coming right up to the road and right up to the footpath line which says that you can build to edge you can remove your setback now setbacks as you can see typically in delhi uh let me give you an example uh, let's say an example of dwarka now dwarka has 45 meter roads okay now dwarka has 45 meter roads meaning from boundary wall to boundary wall it is 45 meter but if you actually see the 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 distance between building line to building line in dwarka is actually 100 meters okay, okay. now what what that means is that uh, a person who is living in the balcony of uh, one of the towers cannot actually communicate to anybody who is living across the road yeah. not just that he cannot communicate to anybody who's walking on the footpath okay right in front of his house now that's a very large distance to actually for anybody to read anybody and adding to that is the fact that you know places like delhi there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of streets which are underlit there's a huge crime which exists i mean the nirbhaya crime is a very very important example here i mean nobody even knew that there is a guy, there's a lady being picked up and there's something happening in the bus you know there are there is crime uh, what do you think what do you what do you, so what do you, what do you, what what i can understand from this discussion is that right. uh, the building should come on the edges is it yeah Instead one of, is uh, that the setback if we have the removal of setback like you see in the old cities of delhi like you see in major uh, very much developed uh, cities of new york london you can see anywhere there is no setback now setback what, what happens, does what, is 
sure. what will happen to air light and all those things that i so you it's, have the road so you basically get all your air light from the road it and it's uh, it's actually something that we over and over discuss with the fire department because fire department is the most crucial department they come to the rescue of the services so as soon as the building is lit up then that is where the fire department becomes more easy to access the building if they are right on the street right. if they have right. to cross the boundary wall they are absolutely right. not done so that was right. point right. number 1 uh, yeah. second is building on the edge and having active frontages yeah. now active frontage is something that most of the cities actually make it safer i mean what do you see uh, getting across from the station you see vibrancy you see a lot of vendors you see a lot of markets which are actually open 24 hours i mean the markets near the railway station never sleep they have never slept uh, but that is the point we are making that you can always live and work at the same place because you can have the shop in the bottom and you can live on the top that's typically what you see in gujarat cities but i think uh, it's hello. nothing that we are doing in but anu anuj i think that is what has been proposed in the new in the new amendments so what is the problem then no actually those are being deleted in the new amendments unfortunately oh those are being deleted okay yes so okay. that is why we are uh, we are actually discussing this okay. is because if we delete those uh, amendments then uh, then we are back to square one okay so, okay great yeah. i think i'm glad that you brought this to oh, yeah okay right yeah so so those are the things now i if you allow me one more minute i would like to respond a little yep. bit uh, to what ms joshi also said now i i agree with mr jo ms joshi on a lot of points and i disagree with her in a lot of points um uh, we, she's absolutely right and most of us are absolutely right that yes there are very dense areas in delhi and actually they're they're gasping for air literally and uh, it's a lot of density so you see uttam nagar you see east delhi they're like hugely built up what do they lack they lack open space as ms joshi also pointed out now what the tod does you know tod gives you that opportunity that you may or may not build 500 fr that's not the concern the concern is that with tod you are able to actually reamalgamate your plots reconfigure them and give that 20 or 30% open space that tod mandates so 20% goes to the uh, roads and 30% goes to the public space so 50% of the area is actually meant for public use and not as opposed to right now which is 50% is in the public uh, is in private hands that's the main difference right i think uh, thanks uh, uh, anush for pointing that out uh, uh, rajib I, I, are you are you uh, there can can you i'm right here listening to everybody yeah. so uh, would you like to contest what uh, anuj said because he said uh, quite interesting things about the about the uh, about the mobility and and, and 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 one more thing that i would like to point at you is because you know uh, naua is responsible for the master plan you know, they are the ones who are actually working on it and now uh, with this tod do you think i mean is it not a kind of uh, confront uh, i mean contradiction between two different agencies working uh, or or do you find a contradiction between the master plan and the kind of tod that is happening so i'll, I'll try to answer that question there are issues between the master plan and the tod policy because there are two different things coming from two different sources we are trying to implement tod in an existing city and in an existing master plan i'll discuss that in more detail but i'd like to go back a little bit to what sanjay and what molshri said and i do agree with a lot of their points uh, i think we must understand these words far and density because density in in the sense in which tod is used means the number of people living in the area and the basic thinking and logic behind transit oriented development is that the largest number of people should be accommodated close to transit nodes so that they have access to public transit systems they are encouraged to take public transit systems and we reduce the amount of private transport in the city which uh, one assumes will reduce pollution will reduce congestion and yeah, have yeah. several other effects this is this is yeah. the basic principle yeah yeah and we must not conflate the words density and far and this is slightly important here because far is a proportion of the uh, amount you can build on a piece of land 
to the area of the land itself right it it is therefore assumed that the higher the far the higher the density will be now these are these are funny technical words and we shouldn't get too worried about the technical words what we should understand is that far is perhaps inappropriately being used as a tool to try and increase densities and it is not often happening and that has to do with something which we haven't discussed yet which is the monetization of land yeah, yeah, yeah. and this is a very tricky that concept yeah, yeah. because that the current pod policy is trying to monetize the land because the government you know in its in its uh, sort of uh, thinking needs to justify the cost of the land on which it is allowing development to happen in doing so it has used a very blunt instrument for a for a for very fine surgery and it has brought in far as a as a very sort of blunt tool as i said which blunt merely says you can surgery. build a lot right yeah. it merely says you can build a lot and this is supposed to sort of counterbalance the cost of the land where all of this development will happen now that's monetization now if we are attempting to monetize things what typically happens and this is why what molshi said is so important is that the kind of development which happens around these sort of uh, high density uh, transit nodes tend to be far higher end they tend to be expensive they tend to be high end the apartments tend to be bigger the shops tend to be high end because those are things which recover the money better and faster so what that actually does is that the transit oriented development in this form becomes a tool for the elite it becomes a way for developers and development to happen which essentially assists those who need it who need it the least who are who are the elite who are the wealthy who are the privileged and typically areas of delhi and i'm assuming and this is I, i know this to be the case in many other cities of india the people who need it the most the the underprivileged the poor those who live in slum like settlements those who live in informal settlements and urban villages they those already will take the metro identities sorry those who will take the metro those who well those who i take the metro, the metro by the way assuming they could afford it because the other part of tod and tod in delhi is that the metro is rather expensive yes uh, as a result of which the people who are actually using the metro yeah, yeah. by and large uh, would yeah, be the yeah. class or are people who have to pay fairly exorbitantly for their metro fare uh, a bus system is is probably far more appropriate in delhi to for transit oriented development yeah so this concept so of monetization yeah. actually becomes a divide between Please. rich and the poor and tod yeah. then becomes a tool to essentially facilitate the wealthy and facilitate expensive rich developments in the city leading right. to larger and larger urban divides and it right. is it is fairly unjust from that perspective and yeah. this will answer your original question because yeah. the master plan of delhi yeah. like any master plan is supposed to be a planning exercise to benefit the largest number of people in the city it is an overall planning exercise which takes into yes. account densities takes into account populations takes into yeah. account economic differences and attempts yeah. to make an overall document which benefits the entire city now when tod happens it is a, it is a policy which tends to look at itself and maybe rightly so every policy needs to look at itself to develop as well as it can but it is simply then overlaid on top of the master plan so what happens is areas of land which are close to these transit oriented developments tend to get built very large and for our viewers who don't understand i think the architects in this group will understand very clearly an far of 4 or 5 which is what is proposed for tod is actually a lot of development it's it's a lot of very large tall buildings yeah. if i just right? if, if i may just ask you because they've said 1 hectare say yeah. for 1 hectare if there's an far of 5 how many stories can you just jump up well that's the, the answer to that is actually a combination of things what that means okay. is you can build five hectares of of yeah of that was, yeah yeah simple. and when yeah, you great. combine that with setbacks which is the distance yeah. which is often given from the boundary wall when you combine that with height restrictions and many other such regulations typically okay. in my mind if one told me five far i would be thinking nothing less than 50 or 60 floors 
perhaps okay. even higher. Uh, okay. The last uh, FAR I developed uh, in my office, which we worked on, was an FAR of four, and our buildings went up to 45 floors in okay. order to try okay. to accommodate it. This is what we're so looking five, at. In yeah. Yeah. Five would be even higher. These five is yeah. a very, very high. We've already, seen, we've already seen the police headquarters coming up right in, and that's where I want to bring uh, Sapna. I'm, thank you so much for, for really uh, listening to all the views. And I think uh, I remember a discussion with you when we were uh, uh, doing a uh, walk the talk at the Central Vista. And you said, you know, this entire Central Vista is our heritage, it's not a colonial heritage. Sapna, can you just uh, explain to our viewers, I mean, what is all about heritage? I mean, what are, I mean, why is it so important for all of us? I think uh, it, it's been very helpful to uh, have the groundwork laid by all the other experts who've uh, really talked about what uh, the POD is and what, uh, more importantly, what are these amendments that are coming in? And I'm looking, let me look specifically at the amendments just to keep it brief. And what it does is that the previous policy as articulated had actually exempted certain areas from this policy, which have now been brought back because those clauses have been deleted. And these areas were very crucial. One is the so-called Latians bungalow zone, which is that New Delhi, a low density, uh, low rise green spaces, that area. And so let me talk about that first. Now there, this is going to have a big impact. Because we have been, heritage experts have been saying for a long time that, uh, in fact, we were looking forward to the new master plan, actually planning for heritage areas in a more defining them, defining their characteristics, defining what can and cannot happen from a heritage point of view. And that is the problem because a policy like this then will not look at heritage. And it has, and as we said, that that's what the, task of the master plan was. But if you can completely ignore it by overlaying this particular policy, then uh, that goes. And uh, as I have mentioned before many times, uh, Latins Bangalore Zone is, is important. It's got not only iconic architecture, it's got those public spaces, those green spaces, which we as a city tremendously lack right now. The other exemption is very interesting also, the LDRA, low density residential areas. Many of these are actually our urban villages. And what people don't often realize is that these are also often, these are, in fact, are some of our, our city's oldest areas. Mehroli, it's a very old area. Uh, Khidki, Hozrani, these are uh, old areas which are rich in heritage, uh, Mohammedpur. So these, and uh, they require legislation, planning, which is of a very, very different uh, kind. So this uh, one size fits all uh, kind of policy might be to very, uh, very deleterious effects in these areas. And uh, these are, the, these are the kind of exemptions that should be looked at this whole business of FAR. Now, one of the things that has been changed in this amendment is that earlier it was seen that the higher um, uh, this, this zone of densification along the mass transit lines would absorb what we call the TDR, which is transferable development rights, yeah. that it would enable us to keep densities low in these crucial heritage pockets. By transferring those rights, we could uh, incentivize people to keep uh, low rise developments, low density developments by transferring those rights elsewhere. And this would, was supposed to be an absorption zone for those TDRs. Now that also has been, uh, that has been uh, deleted now. So these are the ways in which I think the amendments that are coming in are going to impact heritage negatively. And of course, last but not least, the regulated zones of the monuments. I mean, I, I don't even need to go into that. We've, uh, it, it's quite obvious that the kind of development that is um, envisaged is uh, might have, uh, you know, give with the thin edge of the wedge to completely ignore uh, things uh, like, you know, the regulated area, which is uh, around uh, national monuments or state protected monuments. Okay, great. great. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, 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 Sometimes but we'll like like to hear more from you uh, because I think Prem spoke the least. So Prem, are, are you listening to me? 
Yes, yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's something very interesting that Narayan pointed out. And uh, before I jump to Narayan, I think uh, something which is, I mean, which is, uh, I mean, I, I'm quite concerned about that. And that is actually Narayan said that I, mean, I couldn't get the feel who is at the driving seat. According to Narayan, it's the, a bunch of bureaucrats. Do you think it's that naive? I mean, do you not think it's basically the, the kind of policy paradigm that we are witnessing, uh, a kind of nexus between, uh, like, like what, what we speak about land monetization, it's the big corporates, what Sanjay also pointed out, uh, or we just keep it to, you know, a few bunch of bureaucrats are, are, are just playing the shots. I mean, how, how do you take it? And please take your time. No, you I, the, I, I think it's more than just a bunch of bureaucrats. Yeah. Two aspects. One is the way land markets are structured and the other, yeah, the other uh, wording of these amendments. Uh, if you start with land markets, they are notoriously inefficient in India. They're corrupt, they're opaque, they're uh, inefficient, and, and that causes a distortion in prices so that land values in the large Indian cities have no relationship to median incomes. So actually, if you try and uh, sort of map that to median incomes, you find that let alone capital value, even any rental values that ensue, uh, 50 to 60 percent of the population cannot afford to officially locate themselves on a land use plan. And they're pushed outside the system. Now, the poor in the Indian city you have to realize survive because master planning is weak, both in ideation and implementation. And that gives them the space for the informal systems of tenure that allow their survival. And we're talking about a majority of the population here. So, so the problem is when you start pushing paradigms that extend the reach of formal master planning without recognizing this marginalization, you're going to get an increasing contestation over space, which is going to turn increasingly violent. And I think we're beginning to see the first signs of that violence already. Where, where uh, can, you, can you just cite an example? Can you just cite an example? Just pick, pick up the newspapers. The kind of violence we're seeing is because of the frustration of people who are being marginalized. And that's the only way, the only way you can express yourself and mark your presence now for many people in the city is through violence. Uh, from there, I'd like to go to the specific wordings of these amendments. If you, if you look at the original language uh, under TOD, there, was, there were a lot of public interest goals that were identified, like creating safe spaces, increasing affordability of housing, uh, extra space for pedestrians. I mean, th there's a long list. I can go through it. Practically, all of that is wiped out in the new language. And the new language is just about efficiency. It's about FAR. And some fairly overt language on financialization of land is introduced. And I, I, I think I should quote here. Yeah. It says, TOD is an innovative urban paradigm that involves leveraging existing and upcoming public transit infrastructure. TOD is also an important strategy for unlocking the latent economic and land values in the city. And under the TOD policies, development plans for these TOD zones are invited from private developers. So actually, we have public investment, which has gone into creating this public uh, transit, uh, which is being leveraged for private profit. And, and the high land values, which are actually come out of distorted land markets more than anything else, are used as an excuse for needing higher F. So, so we got to realize that we start with a paradigm of planning that is extremely elitist, that produces huge degrees of marginalization. And in the way this current policy is uh, worded, we are just extending that, uh, exacerbating that problem uh, by, by a factor of, you know, multiple factor. Great. I think, thank you. Before uh, I reach out to, because we are really running short of time and I will try to reach out to everyone uh, uh, who's, le who's left for the second round. But I think Sanjay, I would like uh, you to really uh, intervene here. You know, all, all this speaks about uh, land monetization, one, and uh, with, the, with the vision that, look, private capital is going to come and really going to take our woos uh, off. And that's how this development trajectory is going to, uh, going to actually advance. But we have seen the pandemic and we are also witnessing post pandemic what is going to happen. It's delinquency of the buyer. I mean, you know, when we speak about in political economy, I mean, 
where is where are the people who are going to come back and really going to invest in so i mean do you think it's a fool's paradise or i mean it, is there some substance to the entire eod vision that is being developed well Sanjay? um yeah sorry yeah i mean i'm not, i'll just comment on the uh on uh, the, the broader context of vision the tod is embedded you know i mean i think it's of course it's important to think about what private capital does but you know since uh, i would say since 1947 the most significant displacement without any compensation has been done by the state yeah not by the not by private capital we need to we need, we need to think about that the it state is in fact for the private capital yeah <laughs> the state creates the conditions uh, for land markets to be yeah. to 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 be created in fact in delhi i mean it is a state that i fear historically much more than private capital because dda has historically been the largest land speculator or anywhere in the world because it would buy land at agricultural rates freeze them for 10 years 20 years and sell them at enormous market rates so the problem of unauthorized colony so called is actually a state created problem it is not necessarily a problem that private capital does so whilst i'm not a i'm not a i mean i'm not sort of advocating sort of a, a free for all uh, uh, private development but we need to understand nature of our state as well um uh, and you know and 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 the, and the fact that the and the that the formal and the informal in india are completely connected so i think that whilst it is quite true that we should be wary of how private capital and particularly how global consultancy company which are deeply embedded now in the urban real estate sector uh, in real estate sector near function i don't think we should and i probably wouldn't have said this said this 15 years ago we should we should be sort of deeply uh, we should go overboard in terms of thinking about the uh, that that everything that private capital does is essentially uh, bad the history of indian state is a is a horrific history uh, and what what happened in the 1950s and 60s that a small state elite in effect uh, uh, captured uh, most of resources so i think we need to think in our public uh, discourse Uh, we need to also recognize uh, that the larger public discourse is not about people like us nine people like us saying uh, talking to that there is a much greater acceptability um, uh, amongst the la- a larger um, as a larger public for good or bad that the state has failed us right so why why do people think like why do people think that uh, ppp's public private partnerships that build you know tollways are much better or shopping malls are great things i think we need to understand that firstly and then see about well, what is to be the balance after all anyone who is actually concerned about what neoliberalism does would first of all argue that we need to work out what the state should not do that is a, the, the issue is not what the state we should we should need to work out what should the state maybe the state shouldn't be running maybe it should be concentrating on the health sector maybe it should not it may sign sound very kind of sacrilegious maybe state the state shouldn't be running private uh, airlines maybe give you know so i think when you're thinking about cities it's really important it seems to me to work out if you're really interested on uh, the deleterious effects of what private capital does we should think about what the state should not do and now right now what has happened is that the state has increasingly transformed itself with through the social and private capital into large corporations so but, for but, anyone but, yeah. but but do you think is it is it also because of the fact that you know when when i when i brought in that uh, aspect of delinquency of the buyer so you know there's huge amount of capital lying i mean there's nobody i mean there is no offloading taking place so i mean is state facilitating that i mean don't, don't you think so historically it's always been true if you look at yeah. gurgaon yeah. when the change of land uses were, were you know large amounts of agricultural land would change so without the state you cannot have private capital to function in any in 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 so in, what is in, the alternative okay Well, I think the alternative is to, I mean, I as I, as I say, I would not have said this perhaps ten, fifteen years ago, but yeah. to work out what we should we should ask private capital to do and what we should ask the state to do, because often there is tendency for many of us, including myself, to be completely dismissive of uh, of say private capital. Historically, in a country like India, the state has done terrible. I mean, I think most of our urban problems right. have been uh, due to the man of the state has functioned as a monopoly speculator of land so we need to work out what that should be uh, so, because so 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 sanjay some i mean i mean i would like to, narayan to really come to it i mean narayan what sanjay is uh, professing is that look it's not the problem i mean if i could uh, make it very s- simple it's not problem of the master plan it's the master plan in itself i mean if if i could make it that linear 
so i mean what is your take on it and you know we were in keto for the habit at 3 where john claus i mean the executive director kept on screaming saying that look we have to go to back to the basic and the basic cement to get rid of this whole business for lesser ferry you know free market economy in the cities i mean so how do you really place this argument what sanjay is building up i mean it's very interesting that that what 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 is this really see what happened is that this has got into a very technical conversation i yeah. don't know how much of the audience who are lay people are going to be able to follow it but between yeah. the six seven people here very interesting yeah. facets have been explored a lot of it unfortunately is in english and a lot of it has been in very technical language we've spoken okay. about things like density and fr okay. but this is the, this is yeah i know but this is the matter of everyday life you know this is what a citizen actually undergoes sees sanjay says an extremely interesting thesis that equally if you look at each of the facets of what everybody else has said over here yeah. all of that together makes the composite picture of what a city is or what a city should be yeah yeah, uh, yeah so that is a very interesting thesis that actually it's the state which has meddled far too much and uh, to to paraphrase from what sanjay was saying as well do we need our state our master planning authority to be talking prem uh, recounted to us the exact words of the policy and words being used were all about monetization they were about leveraging value i mean yeah. okay now leveraging value is something we expect private capital to talk about and the checks and balances are provided by the state which doesn't allow them to go beyond a certain level or limit which is oh. in the public interest when the Fair state enough. starts talking in this language then the citizen is left bereft yeah yeah and really when master planning was first conceived of it was actually more i'd say a paternalistic idea that the state would watch over the development of a city and yeah. keep it to the straight and the narrow of what actually benefits the larger segment of society Right. Unfortunately, our state has got into running airlines as well as become a developer of cities, and therefore this whole dichotomy that comes in. One thing that I want to bring it back to is, you know, a lot of the conversation has been around Delhi. Even though Prem is sitting in Bangalore, Sanjay is sitting in London, and I wish more of us were sitting in other cities, but this is actually not about Delhi. DDA is the first body implementing it. but this is a national policy the national transit oriented development policy right. the second part is that in this country the dda is actually a precursor to most things it's a progenitor to most things mm -hmm. delhi is the first city that had a metro delhi is the first city that had a brts delhi is the first city that had a master plan delhi is the first city that had a development authority what do you find every city in india picks it up and apes it so the fear is that if delhi dilutes the idea of the transit oriented development the good parts of the transit oriented development not what mojli spoke of mm -hmm. which is to one extent you know anything that we do has a good side and a bad side which is what the citizen is concerned about he is really concerned about how are we improving the quality of his life as planners as architects or as the state mm -hmm. so there are these two facets to it and that's the reason why i said that this is a work in progress this was meant mm -hmm. to develop as it went along we are trying mm -hmm. to pick up a foreign concept and suited to our city but again equally it's not so for in a concept you know things that anuj spoke about like eyes on the street the building up to the street edge that is what jaisalmer is that is what udaipur is that is what cities of gujarat are that is what the yeah. cities of tamil nadu are yeah. yeah i think man we 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 just have to uh, keep the time constant also in mind sure. but amolshri uh, are you there can you can you hear me amolshri yes i'm there uh, hi great so i think uh, very quickly if you could respond to what narayan said and also you know when we speak about the, i mean how do we look at the whole slogan of right to the city you know we discuss so much about sustainable development goals and right to city being the inalienable in inalienable right of uh, of our citizens but yeah. the whole process is so opaque um yes first back to narayan's point about uh, you know well lit cities eyes on the street etc great undeniable concepts how do they land on a city that's already built uh, we are not going to be able to shift building blocks within dwarka what do we really mean when we are you know so let's not uh, i so mean and if the if the visual if if the imagination is has been so detailed i would like that this communication is visualized and presented to the public there is there is no idea how these developments are going to land in heritage areas 
in um, uh, like uh, swapna man- mentioned urban villages uh, if if the vision is so distinct i think the visualization should follow but it doesn't it ne- never does and the the opacity of this process and this imagination is exactly the point of this development so i don't think we ne- we should be naive about uh, how um, this uh, the amendments have sort of added up to hollowing the policy that's really the whole point you know and we need to be very critical of it exactly as a process and not as an end document we've seen a lot of and delhi is a test case we've seen some terrible cases play out already so why are we giving uh, the state such a long you know such a long sort of rope why are we not looking at the evidence that we already have on the ground please look at naroji nagar the 7 gpra colony cases uh, kidwai nagar that has already been planned what has it done to heritage what has it done to greens what has it done to what has it done to walkability and all these things that we talk about why are we not seeing a proof of concept so i i think uh, we don't need to critique the policy in the imagination that it ought to have or how it has been in the experience of cities in europe we need to look at it as a hollow document that it is and that's really very much the point of it if it's talking in terms of financialization or in terms of economics and has taken away the kind of uh, public imagination and the livability then uh, we really have something to worry about so I, i mean i think we need to push back and ask the government uh, to look at this as a you know as as a as you know like you said the right to the city who are we building this for yeah 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 uh rajiv are you there uh, because yeah, i can see you there yeah of course so uh, just two questions i mean because you know we are running short of time as well i mean we really stretch the time beyond uh, what we should have uh, one is what is an optimal density i mean as mentioned i mean what would be an optimal density and second which may not uh, be like directly linked to you uh, and just answer that because uh, and deliberately i'm posing this question to you because you are a, a city planner huh? i mean how do you bring in the people what sanjay also mentioned huh? i mean because after all the city belongs to the people no i mean yeah well uh, just a small correction i'm i'm an urban designer and and uh, yeah. a planner is somebody slightly different very close but slightly yeah, yeah. different um yeah to answer your first question what is the ideal density and the answer is i couldn't tell you um okay. there is no ideal density there is no one density and this point must be understood across the board uh which is one of the problems i think many people and many yeah. experts are having that's why it is a policy it's attempting to be a blanket policy which gives a single mode of development to the whole of delhi to the whole of india if this policy is adopted across uh, many cities and that's rather disastrous we cannot have ideal densities our cities are rich and different and historic uh and uh, you know that has to be worked out with a lot of thinking and study from area to area with a great deal of sensitivity and that that's a word which i think is missing in the current policy because it is a little insensitive to uh, history it's a little insensitive to sensitive parts of um cities uh, in delhi particularly now but possibly into the future and i think the second part of your question part of it is what is what is in what molshri said i think a lot of planning as a process in india and urban design uh, it tends to be couched behind numbers couched behind terminology and i think it is imperative uh, uh, for the planners and for the urban designers and the architects to visualize to show these visualizations to the people to show them what they will lose or gain both uh, may happen in different ways which is one the second part which i think hasn't been discussed too much on this particular panel is that yeah. planning and urban design all over the world i mean uh, this coming from wanting to sort of compare ourselves to many places in the world planning and urban design is moving away from top heavy systems it's moving into systems of what in india is often called local area planning where we go and talk to the people area by area find out their aspirations find out what they want and include and incorporate those in the master plan rather than it being a top heavy system where a state or a government or a, a sort of a, an organization on top 
goes and makes this one sort of master plan in their uh, in their sort of wisdom it does not negate the master planners it does not negate the urban designers their points of view will be taken into account as well and they are sort of uh, educated experts in the subject but we we have to ask the people and the tod policy is not asking the people what they want and what they need perfect, perfect. Uh, and such an exercise hasn't been wish, engaged at all i wish we had more time over to brought the 74th constitutional amendment also here but you know we we can't stretch the time uh, anuj before i go to sapna just to conclude this uh, discussion uh, are you there anuj yeah yeah so uh, i mean your uh, i mean maybe two minutes what else do you want to add what you said just uh, before i mean apart from that uh well let me just say because i've been hearing everybody and uh, uh it's kind of uh, interesting that uh, a lot of uh, things that are being said are kind of hinge to tod policy uh otherwise if they were not tod policy i mean those things are still true i would say so like for example uh talking about visualizations for, uh, to begin with uh talking about land monetization um there is a recent point with rajiv just made um you know about uh, uh talking to people doing the local area plan uh i mean those things are with or without tod i mean you need to do it uh but are we doing it i mean that's the question we all should be asking actually was it done till now uh it hasn't been so Wait, that's so the one that right okay. so i think we need to distinguish things a little bit so that we can uh, do a little more uh, clearer kind of demand in in the way we are asking for things like they, these are not de- these are not uh, uh, bad demands actually these are very valid demands uh, but uh, uh, like for example the visualization now i would like to add here uh, that uh, definitely tod needs to do that um, tod does not end at just being a policy what uh, is being conceived actually is that the whole planning needs to move from being a two dimensional document to a three dimensional figure okay which actually tells people how your city is going to be now that is the aim of tod actually that's one number one second is also i would like to bring in this fact very important fact actually that the tod is trying to bring in density from i don't know where i mean it's not from the air okay mm-hmm. like i will tell you my example i am a middle class guy who earning 2 lakh 20 lakhs a year uh, i've been coming to delhi uh, you know very very frequently i come to delhi very frequently like i take 18 flights in a month uh but uh, till date i have not been able to find any accommodation in the last 7 years of my coming to delhi any accommodation near a metro station or near a transit stop where i can actually go and live or at least rent a place okay because there is no supply in delhi there is no supply of one bedroom one and a half bedroom which i as a middle class person can also afford it's not just about those poor guys i mean i also want that living but i don't find it okay now uh, that's one and all the different discussions that we have had with the builders builders are pretty happy to actually build that kind of uh, uh, small unit uh, size and that's what is being uh, in a way uh, is actually uh, you know that's the uh, uh, the one of the requirements that tod policy also talks about is that a smaller footprint can be built up in a higher density now a person who is actually you know we are talking about these ews guys i know you could just now, wrap up and and just sure. yes, yes. this is the last just point focus i want to make just, yeah yeah, yeah last point i want to make is that we eat uh, yeah, yeah, we all yeah. the poor community and the labor and the migrant workers i mean if you look at uh, how much uh, money they are spending on transportation then they are spending a enormous amount of money on transportation unfortunately it's about 50% of their uh, monthly income and that's a huge amount of money me as a person spend about 8% they spend 50% now what is there is nothing wrong in actually fine. letting them fine, being fine, close fine. to a station yeah yeah we've got that out yeah thanks 
uh, uh, Sapna, are you there? Because you two really confused. Okay. Yeah. Can uh, you hear? Uh, yes, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. So, 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 yeah, I can hear you, sir. Now, just look uh, for, first. Hear my question. Uh, the the point is, I mean, you know, we've uh, 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 we've, we've, we've we've articulated what we are against as of now. You know, we have uh, very interesting discussions from different corners. But what are we fighting for? I mean, for a livable city, for a good city, what would that good city be? And also linking in to the, the whole concept of heritage. And because we didn't have time, so we didn't bring in the urban commons, how, how the urban commons would be affected. But if you could just touch on that and I mean, just conclude this discussion. Yes, I think uh, what uh, Rajiv mentioned about diversity, it's not just between different cities, which this policy might impact. It is within a particular city. And that's one of the things that heritage brings in. For instance, if you look at Latyan's Bangalore zone, New Delhi, it's very, very different from Chajanabad, another uh, planned city, but of a completely different era. And in turn, these are very different from the uh, urban villages that I talked about. This diversity, which should be recognized through heritage in master planning and other kinds of planning. And these are things that uh, we should be looked at. It's not a monument policy. It's not a heritage policy. It should be planning as such, which should yeah. take into account these kind of diversities. One may say that Latin's Bangalore zone is very uh, low density. It should be densified. If you look at the potential for recreation, uh, and over the years, it's been getting less and less the way um, the war memorial has uh, taken over a very important uh, place where people used to lounge around, the India Gate uh, uh, Sea Hexagon, or uh, what has happened to, you know, th th it was not so long ago that people used to just relax on the roundabouts. Now, these have became, become manicured spaces which are completely out of bounds, and I think that is a process that keeps happening. And that aspect of heritage linked to public spaces, I think, has to be very uh, strongly defended, I think. Okay. So, and lastly, I mean, because I mean, that is something that really jitters me. And, you know, this is what, what I, uh, this question I posed to, I think, Rajiv also, how do you or we or all of us link it to the people? Because after all, the depository happens to be there amongst the people. You know, why is it just, I mean, I mean, what, ultimately it's the people, I mean, I mean, who, who, who own the city? Oh, I agree completely. I absolutely yeah. agree. It is the people who, it is, it is the, yeah. the city of the people, by the people, yeah. Uh, yeah. for the people, uh, in every which way. Um, the answer to that is very difficult, um, but we have to look at it at various levels. The state has to be far more benevolent. Uh, I don't think we have an issue with uh, private uh, sort of agencies also funding and being a part of this, they too are part of the people. Uh, they need constraints, they need regulations and guidelines as to how to do so, and that should be the job of the state. And thirdly, we need to have people involved in the master planning process, which, you know, I think as Anut said, really hasn't happened at all. And certainly think, not in I, the case of this DOD policy. I think Prem wants to make a point. Prem, then you can just finally conclude. Or maybe Sanjay also. Prem, can you just? Uh, there's a... There's a very succinct formulation I heard once, which has been called the Panchshila of urban development, saying that okay. cities should be socially just, culturally vibrant, economically dynamic, ecologically sustainable, and politically participatory. And okay. I so think should any, any paradigm of urban development that does not, uh, urban planning that does not uh, fall, uh, measure up to that, we should reject. Okay. So, because what we have now is we have these postulations of what a, a certain a proper city should be without looking at the impact on the population, whereas we should start with the population and see how it can inclusively negotiate its spatial order. Fine. Uh, well, thank you so much. And if there's anybody who wants to make a fundamental point, I mean, which is very crucial to the discussion, can just raise the finger and... Go ahead, else we'll just finish, uh, finish off this. Uh, I just want to say one thing. In all yes, the things that people spoke of, there were a lot of good things spoken about. The reason yeah. we're all here today is because this new modification removes a bunch of the good things. Good. The things that Anuj said, small units. The TOT yeah. policy actually spoke about all the residential units being 700 square feet or less, of yeah. which yeah. half of them were to be only 400 square feet. Therefore, there would have been affordable housing for that lower middle class person that we've thrown out of the city today. Yeah, so but all this goes out. 
these are all going out and that is the reason why we are all here and talking today uh, what is drastic which is being foreseen what is the policy going to do it's going to remove all this intelligence all the equitability all the five punch shield that prem recounted just now are all disappearing in these modifications and that's a cause for worry yeah. okay. मिडिल क्लास so the notion of who the ordinary person has changed yeah, what, unless what we keep that in right, mind sir. yeah what and so now the right. people who complain most that we are being discriminated against is in fact a very privileged group of people yeah. so we need to i think keep that in mind and i'll just stop there that's enough no and uh, can i miss make the last sort of more dark please, point please, here please, the panchil uh, principles are what? great but yeah. what happens to them in a hugely unjust city which is yeah. completely eroded its environment at the moment yeah. we're at the brink of a crisis uh the yeah. question is how do we make these great principles land in a city like this and yeah. that's really the challenge at hand we're not designing from scratch we don't have that luxury anymore thank you, thank you. yeah sapna you uh, you were you raising finger I mean, okay fine so thank you so much i mean it's been a wonderful discussion though as narayan pointed out we went from the north to the south east to it but i think that is that is what was bound to happen with so many architects uh, planners designers and of course historians Uh, and of course, social logists. Uh, the only person that I missed is from my fraternity, from the political fraternity. I mean, mm-hmm. we should have spoken about the seventy-fourth constitutional amendment and what not. But uh, I think we'll continue this, this discussion, uh, maybe uh, not in that large ambit, but in a smaller ambit where we discuss for ten minutes, fifteen minutes, because this struggle is bound to go. It has to grow, else the cities would be just for a handful of people. I don't think that we. a uh, mean cities to be developed for handful of people thank you so much